What is God's passion? Meaning, what is God passionate about? And how do we know what God's passion is? Well, for Christians, God's passion is revealed or disclosed, above all, in the Bible and in Jesus. And as I mentioned last night, in Jesus even more than in the Bible. That is, when Jesus and the Bible conflict, Jesus trumps the Bible. So again, not trying to tell you something you haven't heard before, but suggesting how do we help others to see this? So an overview of how one might show this. Think of the Exodus story. It was the most important story that Israel knew, and still the most important story in the Jewish tradition celebrated every year at Passover. It is what Walter Brueggemann calls Israel's primal narrative, meaning her originating story as well as her most important story. It is the heart of the Torah, that is, of the Pentateuch. And if you ask, what's the Exodus about? Oh, it's so obvious. It's a story of liberation from the ancient domination system of Egypt a liberation that was simultaneously economic, political, and religious. And it's not just about liberation from an imperial domination system, it's also about the creation of a new kind of human community. Or then the second part of the Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible has three main parts. First part is Torah, Pentateuch. Second part of the Jewish Bible, the prophets. Who were the prophets of ancient Israel? Well, again, in a sentence or two, they were God-intoxicated advocates of God's passion for justice against the injustice and violence of the monarchy within Israel. God's dream, to use a phrase from the contemporary, now recently died, religious author Verna Dozier, um, her book is called The Dream of God, God's dream for the earth is a world of justice and peace. And this is central to the Jewish Bible. One of the most familiar passages in the Jewish Bible, it'd probably be on the list of everybody's 20 best known passages, is that famous passage from the second chapter of Isaiah. As soon as I start saying it, you'll recognize it. It speaks of... <clears throat> the time when the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The instruments of war will become instruments of agriculture. And the passage concludes, and nations shall not make war against nation anymore. This is God's dream for the earth, according to Isaiah. And that same passage is also found in the fourth chapter of Micah. And the fact that it shows up in two different prophets suggests that it was a widely circulating saying or dream in prophetic circles as opposed to the idiosyncratic production of just one prophet. And in the book of Micah, you have the same passage word for word, the same, but then at the end, there's another sentence and a half added on, and that extra sentence and a half says, and every family shall sit under their own vine and fig tree. Footnote. It's an image of every family having their own piece of land. And not just land for the production of basic grains like oats or millet. Not just subsistence. But every family with its own vine. Wine to make the heart of human beings glad. And its own fig tree. I mean, a fresh fig, as most of you know, is such a delicacy. I didn't have my first fresh fig until I was in my 30s, I don't think. I had no idea something that wonderful grew on trees and didn't even need to be processed. You know, this is a vision not just of human subsistence, but not necessarily gourmet consumption, 
but every family having their own land, their own vine, their own fig tree. That's the world of peace and justice that God dreams of. And then that passage from Micah ends with, and no one shall make them afraid. A world without fear. And then we get to Jesus. Central to the message of Jesus. And again, if you want to know more about this, um, read any of a number of contemporary books about Jesus, including my own. Central to the message of Jesus is the kingdom of God. And what's the kingdom of God about? Well, it's for the earth. It's not heaven. And you can help people to see this by just reminding them of the Lord's Prayer. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray for the coming of God's kingdom on earth. You know how it goes. We sometimes miss it because of the cadence with which we say the Lord's Prayer. But, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So sometimes when we say it that way, we miss the connection we're praying. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. To echo my friend and colleague Dom Crossan one more time, a great one-liner of his, heaven's in great shape. Earth is where the problems are. <laughs> and the kingdom of God is God's dream for the earth. And what's, what is it about? It's about daily bread. It's about debt forgiveness. It's too bad in a way that we've changed that in some traditions to sins and trespasses. In two of the three versions of the Lord's Prayer from first century Christian texts, the language is debt and debtors. And debt and food were the two central issues of peasant life in the Jewish homeland in the first century. Because of the domination system, Enough food, the material basis of existence, was always an issue in the peasant class. And the other central survival issue was debt. If you fell into debt as a peasant and couldn't pay or repay the debt, you would lose your land if you still had a small piece of land. And if you didn't have land, you and your family would be collateral for the debt, and you could be sold into slavery, meaning indentured servitude, if you didn't repay your debt. The coming of God's kingdom on earth means daily bread and debt forgiveness for the peasant class. And Jesus spoke primarily to the peasant class, not because he didn't like us, but because that's what his mission was. Transparent. The elites lived in cities. The 90% of the population that lived was peasant class, including manual workers as well as agricultural laborers, lived in rural areas. And the Gospels report that Jesus never went to a city except Jerusalem. And you got killed there, of course. But his mission was to the small towns and villages and rural areas where the peasants were. Think of the Lord's Prayer as a prayer taught to the peasant class. God's kingdom is about bread for the world and debt for you. And of course, it's because, precisely because Jesus was a radical critic of the domination system of his time, uh, centered in the imperial domination system, which in turn was centered in the temple in Jerusalem in the Jewish homeland, it's precisely because he was an advocate of the kingdom of God and a critic of the domination system that he was executed. It's a very illuminating question to ask, why was Jesus killed? That's a very different question from why did Jesus die? You know, you can possibly give answers like, well, Jesus died for the sins of the world, but it makes no sense to say Jesus was killed for the sins of the world. Jesus was killed because, like Oscar Romero in Central America, he challenged the domination system that ruled his time and was attracting a following, and they decided to snuff him out. That's what domination systems do to those who oppose them and begin to become somewhat public. Continue. 
this overview. The language that we use for Jesus, some of the most familiar language, and I mentioned some of this briefly this morning. Jesus as Son of God, Lord, Savior of the world, the one who brings peace on earth, to which I could add, God and God from God. All of these are titles of the Roman emperor in the first century. So when the New Testament uses this language about Jesus, they are deliberately saying no to the imperial domination system and yes to what they have beheld of God's passion in Jesus. Caesar's not the savior of the world. Caesar's not the one who really brings peace on earth. Caesar is not the true son of God or Lord. Jesus is. That language is simultaneously religious and political, and to see that language as only religious risks betraying the passion for which Jesus was willing to give his life. Or Paul. Paul's most central affirmation about Jesus is, Jesus is Lord, and therefore Caesar is not. Or finally, the book of Revelation The central theme of that somewhat difficult book, which has become a happy hunting ground for cranks over the centuries, the central theme of that book is really the lordship of Christ versus the lordship of Caesar, the lordship of empire. The beast from the abyss in Revelation 13, whose number is 666, there's no mystery about who that is. If you put that book in its first century context, it's very clear that the beast from the abyss is the Roman Empire. The number 666 using known means of decoding a number into a name spells out in Hebrew the name Caesar Nero, the Emperor Nero. The conflict, once again, in that book is between the lordship of God in Christ and the lordship of empire. All of this as a way of showing the political dimension of the Bible from beginning to end. So part three, how do we educate about this in congregation? First suggestion, a course or reading group. I should have made that plural, courses or reading groups. Um, a course or more in the prophets or in the political passion of the Bible. And let me here especially recommend reading groups. If you're going to have a course, then you have to have, you know, a fairly well-educated teacher who's confident about his or her material and so forth. But the advantage of reading groups is that they don't require expert leadership. They simply require people willing to do it, of course, but a leader or two who are good group facilitators, good discussion facilitators. And the agreement is that everybody in the group read the assigned chapter, whatever it is, prior to the session when you get together. And there are real advantages in talking about the thought of an author who's not in the room people will feel very free to disagree with somebody who's not in the room. Whereas if a staff person is teaching it, or even a lay volunteer, some people out of politeness won't want to take issue with them. So the chances of a really candid conversation about this are probably greater with a reading group. And most of contemporary mainstream biblical scholarship affirms just what I've been talking about in terms of the political passion of the Bible, so there are rich authors to choose from. Some of the suggested books, and this sounds self-serving in a way, but for an overview and comprehensive treatment, my reading the Bible again for the first time works very well from beginning to end to show this dual passion of the Bible. And I write for this audience. For this is a central theme of the Exodus, the Prophets, and the Gospels. Walter Brueggemann's book, The Prophetic Imagination, is good. These are just for instances. For a study of nonviolence as an alternative to war, Walter Wink's little book, Jesus and Nonviolence, is magnificent. 100 pages long, and they're half pages at that. 
$6.95. It's a wonderful adult study group book. Another suggestion, do a Bible study, and I'm going to suggest in particular a Bible study of the book of Amos. Let me suggest why. It's hardly that the book of Amos is short. It's only nine chapters long. It's partly that there's hardly anything else in the book of Amos except God's passion for economic justice. So you can't miss it. And it's also because Amos can change lives. A quick story, Amos changed my life. Uh, I underwent a, a really the central political conversion experience of my life at age 20 or 21 because the book of Amos had been assigned in a political philosophy course that I was taking. And nobody had ever asked me to read the book of Amos before. I mean, I'd grown up in the church, and I knew the Bible pretty well. I probably had memorized more Bible verses than anybody in my town and can still do sword drills or verse and, uh, you know, um, what, uh, chapter and verse numbers with anybody and hold my own, okay? And I had memorized the books of the Bible backwards and forwards, okay? But nobody had ever asked me to read Amos. And I read Amos, and I was absolutely shocked by what I found. Let me give you a bit more of a background. Like many Christians of my generation, perhaps especially Lutheran Christians, I grew up as a Republican. Now, I'm not getting partisan here. I'm just doing biography for you. And, um, uh, you know, my family... They, they, they were good-hearted Republicans. Okay. They weren't... <laughs> I mean, they weren't mean-spirited Republicans, you know, who thought poor people are getting exactly what they deserve. I mean, you know, weren't, weren't that bad. Good-hearted Republicans. And, uh, you know, my mom was so Republican that when Jimmy Carter was elected president, and she was in her 70s by then, um, she boycotted peanut butter for the rest of his <laughs> term. She didn't carry signs around saying, stop buying peanut butter. She simply refused to buy it. And she loved peanut butter. I mean, this was a big sacrifice for her. So I, I come from a long line of political activists. <laughs> and uh, I was sufficiently Republican growing up that by my sophomore year in college, I was president of the Young Republican Club, and the conservative political columnist for the weekly college newspaper. Well, then the Book of Amos got assigned in this course. And uh, as I mentioned, I was just stunned by what I found there. It not only converted me politically, but it was really also my first adult experience of reading the Bible, by which I mean finding something in there I didn't expect. To show you the magnitude of the change, the column I wrote for the college newspaper the week before I read Amos began like this. The American eagle is in danger of being changed into a mother hen. You can kind of see how that would go. Rush Limbaugh would love that. Okay. The week after I read Amos, my column began the only legitimate Christian political position is democratic socialism. <laughs> and, and my readers were shocked, <laughs> all five of them, you know. Um, now, it's not that I would say democratic socialism is the phrase we should use today for a different kind of society. I have nothing against the phrase, but it takes a lot of explaining. The point of that story is simply to illustrate Amos can change lives. And there is some real advantage in doing political consciousness raising in congregations through Bible study because most people will feel at least obligated to wrestle with it if they can be shown that it's in the Bible. If they just hear it from clergy or some teacher, they can just think, oh, they got some liberal ideas in seminary or someplace, and they're running them at us. See it there in the Bible in an unmistakable way. You can't dismiss it so easily. By the way, if you do do a 
Bible study of the book of Amos, I suggest at least six sessions, not just one or something like that. And this means people will say the first session would be for introduction and group building and whatnot. And then maybe sessions two through five, they're assigned two or three chapters for each session that are to be read before class. And then spend class time actually talking about passages so it doesn't get away from the words that are right in front of your face. And then a sixth session for a looking back and what did you get from this and so forth. And I'm not trying to give you a whole syllabus there. I'm simply suggesting don't try to rush it. Help people to see that it's right there. Another suggestion. And this could be used as a way of starting a conversation about Christianity and politics in your congregation, in small group work and so forth. The political journey exercise, and I've used this a number of times in workshops I've done. But invite people with a piece of paper and a pen and maybe a journal, but it can just be loose paper too, to get in touch with some memories. For example, go back to your earliest childhood memories associated with politics. And different people will be able to get back to different ages. I can get back to the election of Tom, of uh, Tom Dewey, to the election of Harry Truman in 1948. That's my earliest political memory. My mom was upset that uh, Truman had won. And I remember, I was five, I remember lying on the kitchen floor looking at this newspaper spread out on the floor and she was explaining to me that that was a picture of Truman and that was a picture of Tom Dewey and Dewey of course had a mustache and my mom said if only Dewey had shaved off his mustache he would have won. <laughs> That's my earliest political memory. It's without consequence but the point being invite people to get in touch with their earliest memories associated with politics and I put in some um, further pump-priming questions here. Was politics talked about in your home? Did you know what your parents were? By age 10 or 12, did you know what you were politically, if somebody had asked you? And then this goes beyond memory. How much of that has changed or remained the same? If your political orientation has changed, when and why? You have a political conversion story, and I make it clear that a political conversion story need not mean changing from one party to another. It might mean a real deepening of something you already held. A lot of people have political conversion stories. When I've used this exercise, and it goes through stages, early childhood, and, and you don't do where you are now right away, of course, um, there's a lot of laughter in the room. People find these stories entertaining, kind of funny. And nobody can say about your earliest political memory, how can you think that way? You know? So you get to know each other. There's group sharing. You're talking about politics. It's low risk. And then eventually you get to, you know, how do you see things now? What role, if any, does the Bible play in that? And so forth. Another suggestion. Consciousness raising about systems and how they affect lives. I emphasize this because lots of scholars have argued that the United States is the most individualistic country in the world. There's some good things about individualism. But one of the things that happens when you think politically, if you are primarily an individualist, is that you tend to think that the most important outcomes in a person's life are the result of their own individual initiative or lack thereof. And that kind of political individualism thus becomes very often a justification for large gaps between rich and poor. Now I'm among, in a way, the rich. So I say this as one of you who are wealthy, Jesus has been mighty good to me, okay? Um, but so many well-to-do people, I don't mean 99%, but so many well-to-do people will justify their wealth on the grounds that they've worked really hard. 
that they made use of the opportunity that this society provided them. And there may be truth in that. But the implication is that those who have not done so well could have if only they had made the same use of their opportunities that I had. So it's their own fault if they didn't make it. I could be a poster child for the political right. I grew up really poor. I mean, no running water, no toilet. In Minnesota, in the winters. Um, mom and dad working at minimum wage jobs when I was in junior high and high school. And I don't want to overly dramatize it. But really poor. And I've made it. But I don't for a minute think that I'm prim primarily responsible for making it and therefore I ought to be able to keep as much of my income as possible and therefore lower taxes as a central political issue in this country. There is so much good fortune in my life, a genetic inheritance, a good health, a good mind, a public school system that was still pretty good. Parents with good values, and I had nothing to do with choosing their values, okay? Um, a number of really fortuitous happenings that I had no control over. The notion of the self-made person who ought to be able to keep as much as possible of what they've worked so hard to get is just bogus. Now, don't hear that I'm advocating socialism or communism or whatever, I'm simply challenging that ideology that emphasizes that one's station in life is primarily the result of one's own individual effort and responsibility. And this leads back then to the point I started to make, the importance of raising consciousness about systems and how they affect lives. I can't detail this because I'm already at 53 minutes, so let me do it quickly. You could do it with race by talking about how things were 50 years ago in this country, rather than starting with how they are today, because then you can get into an argument about whether, how much or how little things are better and so forth. But just to raise the question, did an African American have as much opportunity in this country 50 years ago as the average white person? I don't know anybody today who would say, well, of course they did. Well, why didn't they? Well, it's because...